Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have Mike Robb, the CEO of AirIQ. AirIQ trades on the TSX Venture under the symbol IQ and in the US under AILQF. The company is trading at 31 cents with roughly 30 million shares outstanding or about a $9 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andreola. Hey, thanks Trevor. Um, uh, we were joking a little bit about it earlier, Mike. Uh, we've been persistently trying to get you on. Uh, you finally broke down. I think Trevor's <laughs> been bothering you enough, and you're, you're finally joining us. So happy to have Michael Robb here with us from AirIQ. Um, Mike, I'm just going to turn it over to you. I understand you have a presentation. I'll let you, uh, I'll let you run for now. Great. Okay, Paul, thank you for that. I'll just share my screen here, and hopefully uh, you can see that. Second, here. Let me just see. Okay, can you see that? Okay, you sure can. Yeah. All right. So, thank you for that, Paul. Um, I will walk through a brief presentation, uh, following which I'll be happy to answer any questions, of course. Before, oh, sorry, Paul. I'm a bit of a. Oh, there we go. Before I begin, I would like to draw your attention to our standard disclaimer. Uh, during today's session, certain forward-looking statements may be made that are based on management's best estimates under the current operating environment. We encourage you to do your own research and to uh, view the company's filings available on CDAR. As Trevor mentioned, we are publicly listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol IQ. Our current market cap is approximately $9 million with an enterprise value of approximately $7 million after we deduct the $2 million of cash on hand at the end of the last reporting period. AirIQ is an IoT-based asset management service provider that allows commercial businesses to effectively and efficiently monitor their assets in near real time. Our solutions are reliable and easy to use and are customizable to meet specific needs of our customers. We offer flexible and competitive pricing plans, and we deliver exceptional after-sale client care support. I'll walk through a brief history of our company, what we, where we've been and what we've accomplished so you can understand where we're headed. The company was founded in 1997, almost 25 years ago. In those early days, the primary focus for the company was to rapidly expand top line revenue without regard to being profitable or generating cash. Two acquisitions were successfully completed in 2004 that were heavily financed through various loan arrangements. While following those acquisitions, the company's top line revenue did grow substantially However, so did the losses and the cash burn. As a result, the company sold those acquisitions to repay the loans and to use any remaining proceeds to support ongoing operations. From 2009 to 2014, the company's top line revenues diminished significantly. The losses continued to grow, resulting in negative operating cash flows. Ongoing operations during this period of time were being addressed by entering into a series of convertible debt instruments that were later satisfied through the is issuance of shares. I was appointed as the CEO of AirIQ in 2014. The board and I were completely aligned in our strategy to generate stakeholder value in the future. We believe that that value could be generated by focusing on steadily increasing our recurring revenues over time, by delivering operational and net income profitability, and generating cash flows from operations. In order to meet this objective, the company needed to be right-sized. 
several initiatives were quickly undertaken to right size the business. We downsized our staffing levels. We implemented salary reductions across the board for the remaining uh, employees. We also relocated our corporate head office to a much smaller facility, as well as we negotiated, renegotiated our significant supplier contracts. I'm pleased to say that these initiatives resulted in the company reporting its very first operating net income profitability and positive cash flows from operations in the company's history. We also successfully transitioned from the 2G wireless carrier shutdown while remaining profitable and generating cash flows. Once the business was on stable financial footing, we embarked on the next stage of our evolution, which was to reinvest some of our profit back into our technology team and infrastructure. This area of the business had, received, had not received very much attention in several years, resulting in mounting technical debt that was preventing us from remaining competitive for future growth and scalability. During this time, we were also successful in acquiring the assets of a small telematics company. And I'm pleased to say that that acquisition was completed from operational cash flows without dilution to shareholders. Following that acquisition, we identified an opportunity to expand our go-to market strategy and successfully launched our reseller channel in late 2018. Prior to the launch of this channel, all of AirIQ sales were being generated by one sales resource with no marketing support in a direct to customer channel. The next stage of our evolution was to provide much needed marketing support to our two sales channels. We hired an in-house marketing specialist who has been instrumental in developing marketing campaigns, refreshing our corporate website, and successfully launching our social media presence on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. All of these initiatives have generated opportunities for our sales team. We have also engaged the services of a third-party lead generation company that has also expanded our sales pipeline. We expanded our go-to market strategy by successfully launching two new product offerings, a battery powered device and a fully integrated video telematics solution. Both of these offerings have expanded our market to into segments that were not previously available to our sales team in the past. As mentioned, AirIQ provides asset management solutions to meet growing market demands. The asset tracking segment is expected to grow by nearly 15% year over year until 2024. One of the reasons we launched a fully integrated video telematics solution was to meet the underserved and growing needs of an expanded market. According to research, this market is expected to grow by nearly 22% year over year until 2029. Currently, all of AirIQ's solutions require a third-party hardware device and a wireless carrier data plan, which are purchased by AirIQ and then configured to meet the needs of our customer. The device is then installed on the customer's asset and the information is then being transmitted from the device over the wireless carrier network with the output reflected on our proprietary platform, AirIQ Fleet. AirIQ Fleet is available as a web application and as a mobile application on the iOS and Android platforms. AirIQ Fleet is used by fleet managers, administrators, and workers to effectively and efficiently monitor their assets in near real time. We believe that we are now well positioned to become the one-stop shop for customers that have a variety of different assets that they need to manage. The combination of our robust product offerings, our flexible and competitive pricing plans, together with our customizable solution 
are expected to drive recurring revenue growth over time. Traditionally, AIRIQ's solutions were targeted at monitoring vehicle fleets. With the addition of our two new product offerings, we have expanded our market to address a wider range of use cases. Our objective to steadily grow recurring revenue over time has been achieved over several periods, as you can see from this slide. We believe that we will continue to drive recurring revenue steadily over time, and it remains our focus as we believe that it has delivered increased stakeholder value. Our disciplined approach and focus on our recurring revenue streams and management of our business has resulted in a strong cash balance of nearly $2 million and has also increased the book value of shareholders' equity by nearly 100% since my appointment as CEO. During the onset of the pandemic, we were able to quickly move to a work from home environment with minimal impact to our business. We have continued to deliver recurring revenue growth, remained profitable and maintained our strong cash balance throughout the pandemic to date. We have applied for and received wage subsidies from the government and we have an unused $750,000 operating line of credit with our tier one Canadian financial institution. We are a profitable business that is set to grow. We believe that we are well positioned to organically grow our recurring revenue streams over time. The addition of our new product offerings, our lead generation activities, and further investment in our sales and marketing initiatives are expected to achieve this growth. We have a strong cash balance that can be used for acquisitions to further grow our business. We will remain opportunistic and disciplined in our M&A activities to inorganically drive recurring revenue growth. Paul, that ends my brief presentation and I'll turn it back over to you now. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. Um, why don't we, uh, let's see, where, where should we start? Uh, um, who, who's, your, who's your typical customer? Who do you predominantly sell to? Yeah, so we, we have a, a broad mix of customers that uh, we sell to. Um, we target small to medium enter enterprise companies in um, various market verticals. So construction, commercial transport, logistics companies, and service fleets typically are our typical customers. And you get you guys sell direct. Do you have a sales force, or how do you how do you get in front of these customers? Yeah, so we have two um, two sales channels. One is direct to customer, and one is a reseller channel. So we have two ways we can reach uh, customers um, that we use today. And uh, obviously, your product is both hardware and software. Maybe give us a breakdown of what um, you know when when customer is buying the service. What is, what is he paying for hardware? What is he paying for software? What, what kind of revenue mix are you getting? Yeah, so we have various um, flexible pricing plans and options. Uh, some of them include um, the addition of the hardware included in the monthly service plan. And then others, you know, want to buy the hardware and then just enter into a monthly service plan. So we're very flexible um, in our pricing plans. And, you know, some customers want the uh, upfront capital expenditure um, and have the wherewithal to, to uh, do that. Others don't want to have that capital outlay and we're happy to help them uh, with that so it becomes more of an operational expense. So the mix is, depending on the market and the customer's requirements, um, we're very flexible and, and open in our, in our pricing plans. And um, obviously the, the, sort of the, the golden fruit here, so to speak, is the recurring revenue. Um, do you do you sort of give away the software at cost? What what kind of markup do you have, if any, on hardware? And you know, give us a sense of what you do to try to capture that recurring revenue. Sure. Yeah. So you know, we we view hardware as a means to an end. Okay. So we don't um, 
we use the, the hardware is required for our service, as I mentioned during the presentation. So we don't typically try to mark up the hardware um, significantly. Um, we're happy if we just break even to get the recurring revenue streams, which are at a much higher margin at around 75 to 80%. So sometimes we break even on the hardware. Sometimes we may offer it at a discount depending on the opportunity, but we typically try to break even on the hardware uh, to get the higher uh, value margin service revenue. Mm -hmm. And typically how long does a customer stick around with you guys? Yeah, you know, we've been around for, you know, 25 years now. We have customers that have been with us for 15, 18 years. Um, so, you know, a typical customer is, you know, pretty, pretty uh, sticky to air IQ, you know, in the five to 10 year period, typically, okay. is what we're finding. Gotcha. And um, do you have any customer concentration? Is there any one customer that, that is a big percentage of your overall revenue? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we disclosed in our last uh, financial statements that we have one customer that represents approximately 10% of our revenue. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that has um, been uh, mitigated by more direct customers coming on board and certainly with the expansion of our reseller channel. So we're very pleased with the, with the results of that. Um. Now it's it's a fairly competitive business that you're you're in, um, obviously growing, so it's going to attract probably more and more competitors. But what what do you think makes you better? If if I talk to a customer, why would they say they picked you over some other uh, competitor? Yeah, so I think what you'll find when you talk to our customers, they'll tell you that our solution is very uh, reliable first and foremost. So you know it, it doesn't go down uh, very often. Um, if at all, um, it's very stable, easy to use. Um, you know, we we see competitors offer uh, all the bells and whistles, and it looks really whizzy and everything. But really, functionally, they're only using about ten percent of it, but they're paying a lot more for it. So our solution is very easy to use, very reliable. Our price points are are very competitive, and we're open to working with customers directly. And you know, our after sale customer care support is second to none. Um, and we work with our customers. If they have a specific need, um, they have direct access into our uh, technology team and our support team to help them uh, overcome that hurdle. And so we become a true partner with our customers. And I don't believe that many of our competitors offer uh, that same type of support uh, that, that RIQ does. Um, so you mentioned some new products that you've launched, uh, the battery device and the camera. Um, can you give us a sense of um, sort of wh where's the technology trends in your in your business? Are, are we going to see more cameras involved? Are we going to see more um, sort of different kinds of networks? Um, are these are is technology getting smaller, faster? You know, all that sort of stuff. Just generally, what trends do you see in your industry? Yeah, I mean, we certainly see that the, the fully integrated video telematic solution is critical uh, for our future, we believe, because it, it does provide um, the technology. It's a very simple, small camera, uh, forward-facing, driver-facing camera, two-wire install. It's very easy to install, but packs a lot of functionality um, for an ROI for businesses, as well as because it's fully integrated with our fleet tracking platform, it actually uh, replaces some of the other hardware uh, for tracking purposes um, and, and for monitoring. So, you know, we see the, the camera as being uh, a, a game changer for us in the future, uh, for sure. Uh, the battery powered device, certainly a market we've never been able to, to tap into before with, uh, we've always required a, uh, a vehicle or a piece of equipment with, with a, uh, uh, a power source to be able to tap into. These battery powered devices can be stuck on anything, um, skids, containers, waste disposal bins, livestock, anything that you can think of that needs to be tracked. And it's uh, quite remarkable. So we're very encouraged by those two new product offerings that we brought to market. And uh, we believe that the technology, I don't know how it could get much smaller. I'm sure that uh, you know it, it's out there. I'm sure people are working on it. 
but uh, you know, it is it is pretty uh, pretty amazing what uh, what these two new product offerings can do. And um, uh, all the products that you guys use, is it all sort of um, your creation, uh, or, or do you outsource and, and use off the shelf stuff? Yeah, no, I think uh, back in the day, back when their IQ started, we we did um, design and uh, QA and QC test um, our own devices. Um, some of those devices are still in the field working today, remarkably. Uh, right. But because the company was downsized, we, we didn't have the ability to do that anymore. And the hardware business became much more commoditized. Um, so it didn't make sense. So what we did was we partner with various uh, hardware manufacturers that provide the hardware for our solution that's used in our solution. Um, I guess that kind of leads to another question that we, we always ask. It, it, it's related to sort of the you know the last year. Um, COVID has caused all sorts of disruptions. Um, if you're outsourcing product now, it becomes an issue in terms of getting supplies of products. Um, may, maybe give us a sense of operationally how has COVID affected Air IQ? Yeah, I mean we we've been very. Uh, fortunate, we've been uh, almost uh, COVID-proof um, to this point. Like I said, we've remained uh, profitable. We've continued to grow our recurring revenue streams. Um, you know, we've maintained our cash balance uh, throughout the pandemic to date. Uh, so, you know, we're we're you know, we didn't grow as as fast as we would have liked because of the the, the COVID uh, situation, and we've had to help some of our customers through it uh, financially by you know, helping them with uh, reduced uh, fees and or, uh, you know, not charging them or, you know, asking for payment uh, type of thing. So we've been very helpful throughout this uh, period of time, this, this difficult period of time for some businesses. But despite all of that, we've been able to continue to grow our recurring revenue streams, remain profitable and, and maintain our cash balance. So we're we're not unscathed, but we haven't been as impacted as other businesses at this point. And then has has COVID? I mean, it's COVID seems to have um, uh, you know increased the speed of a certain technology adoption. Are you seeing any sort of new opportunities, or maybe bigger opportunities because of uh, the, the sort of change in the world right now? Um, it hasn't really impacted us. I think where we've seen some, uh, you know, pickup is in the logistics uh, business uh, for, you know, certainly delivery and service vehicles, that type of thing. We've certainly seen increased activity and interest in, in that market segment for us during COVID. But the rest, um, you know, has been pretty stable and, and uh, you know, traditional. Gotcha. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about your financials. Um, you know, one of the things that, that seemed quite appealing for your company, albeit that you guys are small, you have a pretty healthy balance sheet. Um, like you stated earlier, about $2 million in cash. Um, you know, you, you have a NCIB in place, a sure buyback. Um, you, you mentioned m and um, Sort of give us a sense of what, what the opportunity to use that cash looks like going forward? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, our primary objective, my primary objective and focus is to always look at opportunities to increase stakeholder value. I mean, that's, you know, everything that I do and everything we look at as a business is geared towards that end goal. Um, we believe that, you know, the market presented an opportunity um, for us because we believe it's undervalued. We believe our stock is undervalued and it's presented an opportunity for us to create stakeholder value by repurchasing our shares, which, you know, in an anti-dilutive way uh, for our shareholders to increase the value. So, you know, we're very opportunistic. We're very, uh, you know, focused. So when the opportunities present themselves like the stock market, we believe it's undervalued, we will take advantage of that and buy back some of our shares. Um, so that's one way we, we've used our cash. Uh, so far um, in repurchasing some of our shares. Uh, we, you know, but for the most part, we want to earmark that for uh, M&A activities. Um, we believe that, you know, there's, there's, we have an M&A pipeline that we work and are actively working and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to 
you know, find an opportunity that is both synergistic and accretive to, to Air IQ to provide that uh, increased stakeholder value that I mentioned. And that's what we aim to do. And when you're looking at M&A, um, are you more interested in buying a business that has relationships or are you looking for technology that you can sort of plug into your offer? Yeah, I think um, it's a bit of both. I think, you know, it's, it's we want to find um, businesses that are creative and synergistic to Air IQ. And if it has technology that we don't currently have, then, then that's a bonus. Uh, it's not typically, you know, top of mind, um, but we certainly want to uh, have steady increased recurring revenue streams and maybe in markets that we're not currently in uh, that can increase our, our footprint and that can provide further sales opportunities with the product offerings that we currently have. And you mentioned uh, sort of geographical footprint. You operate mostly in North America, I believe, is that correct? Yes, exclusively in North America, correct. Okay, okay. Any, any interest in working outside of North America? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've entertained opportunities as they presented themselves in other uh, geographical regions. And for, you know, one reason or another, it, it hasn't worked out. But we're certainly open to expanding into other markets and other regions uh, as opportunities present themselves and as they make sense to us. Gotcha. I, I've got a couple more questions, but I want to remind everybody that's listening, if you do have questions for Michael, um, Please use the chat function and I'll do my best to, to ask. Um, why don't we, I'll give you one more question, then we'll jump into some of your questions. Um, insider ownership, um, just give a breakdown of uh, how much management owns and maybe any other significant shareholders you should be aware of. Yeah, so what I can tell you, Paul, is what's out there uh, in the public market. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Mosaic Capital Partners, uh, which is uh, our, our chairman. Um, Vernon Lobo, I think they own just under 20% of the business. Uh, myself, I own about 3% of the business. And outside of that, the rest of it is, is you know, uh, generally out there in the market. Um, and, and we're not sure what the, what the hold is beyond that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. Well, let's listen. Let's, uh, let's jump on some questions from some of our listeners here. Um, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, well, here's Jerry. <laughs> um, okay, so Jerry says, typically what portion of contract is allocated to hardware versus service revenue? And when does Air IQ recognize revenues for hardware and service time uh, uh, and service time on a term contract? Multiple there. Yeah, multiple. So, you know, it, it's difficult to answer because we don't disclose the, the breakdown between our hardware and revenue um, in a lot of cases. I know that a lot of uh, people want to try and equate the hardware revenue to the service revenues as an indicator. Um, that's not always possible given our various uh, pricing plans. So, and to say typical, it's, it's difficult. It, it, again, it depends on the market and the customer. So, you know, unfortunately I, I can't give you a, a clear answer on that. Um, I can't remember, what was the second part of Jerry's questions? Uh, and when does Air IQ recognize revenues for hardware and service? Yeah, so I mean, because of accounting regulations and rules, um, being a public company, we are required to record those revenue streams over uh, the life of the contract. So if a contract is a three-year contract um, and the company enters into it, we have to kind of put that on our books as deferred revenue. And you'll see that on our balance sheet. You'll see yeah. deferred hardware, deferred uh, airtime revenue and typically that is those contracts being amortized over the life of the contract and they're brought in on a month by month quarter by quarter basis yeah that makes sense uh, okay next question is where do you manufacture the hardware yeah so we don't manufacture any uh, hardware uh, products at all we buy all of our third-party hardware from mm -hmm. from suppliers um, from various suppliers. It's, we're not a single source. Uh, we do uh, have several uh, different uh, suppliers for hardware, but we don't, we don't manufacture our own at all. Yeah, yeah. No, you say that earlier. Um, mind you, um, you know, we've seen a lot of other companies that have had issues in sourcing uh, product because of COVID, uh, a lot of, you know, early on in China, in the manufacturing facilities there were having a hard time getting stuff out. Uh, do, do you face any of that? 
Uh, no, we haven't to date, Paul. We've been, uh, you know, we've put um, strategies in place to mitigate that potential risk. And uh, we're quite happy with the strategy and it's, it's worked out for us so far and we don't expect it to change. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we'll skip one question here. Uh, okay, so uh, I think it's a question. Yeah, I believe electronic logging is becoming regulated for trucking industry in Canada beginning in June, 2021. Is this a big market opportunity for ERIQ and is your product offering ready today to serve this market? Yes, uh, that's a great question. And uh, yes, we are all over uh, that uh, Canadian mandate. Um, we do expect that um, the device that we use will be certified by the third party certification company that the government has put in place um, momentarily over the maybe over the next uh, month or so. It's in process, but we are ready to go. Uh, we've been marketing the ELD HOS uh, solution to our uh, target audiences for several months now. So we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we've got one more question here. Uh, is is AIQ open to an exit strategy through takeover in the medium term? Uh, yeah, again, you know, we're opportunistic. If, 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 a, if a potential, uh, you know, takeout uh, type scenario uh, comes to our attention, and we believe that it provides the value that we believe AIQ has for its stakeholders, then, you know, we will definitely look at that. We are not, you know, um, closed to any of that, uh, provided that it makes sense for our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, you know, you're, you're a small business, you're still, you're going nicely, you do have cash, but is there anything you're missing? Is there any key people or any key, you know, pieces that you think you need to be able to, to continue to grow at a decent pace? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, what's, what's interesting is, you know, we, when I took over there, I think we basically had to, you know, rip the company back down to, to bare bones and then build it back up as I described. I think now I'm, I'm very confident that we have most of the pieces that we need to uh, continue to grow our recurring revenue streams um, over time again. It, it does take time, um, but there's nothing really, I think that we have the opportunity because of our margins that we have and the profit, we might reinvest some of that profit and margin back into some more sales and marketing initiatives to drive um, recurring revenue growth um, higher than we've been able to in the past. So we definitely are looking at those opportunities. And again, if it provides the, uh, the increase in stakeholder value, which we believe recurring revenues will do, uh, then we're going to be taking a look at that. But we're going to be opportunistic and we're going to be you know, um, disciplined in, in the deployment of that capital and our profits. Very nice. Um, what, if anything, keeps you up with me? Um, not much these days, Paul. I'm I'm very excited. Other than our stock price, sometimes that uh, causes me some some fits in the middle of the night because I don't understand why it's uh, so low um, and undervalued. Uh, but you know, I think some of the some of the uh, the COVID situation for some of our customers, um, unfortunately, some of the as you described the, the supply chain issues that a lot of companies are faced with uh, with that. Um, you know, again, we put plants in place strategies in place. So there's not a lot that keeps me up at night um, now. Um, certainly a lot less sleep back in the early days when I became the CEO, uh, but I'm, I'm definitely confident and, and proud of what our team has accomplished and what we're able to do going forward. No, absolutely should be. Um, okay, so somebody else is throwing a question in here. Uh, Apple has, has made a little bit of a splash in, in sort of, I guess, somewhat, somewhat your uh, industry. But um, any thoughts on, on Apple coming out with the tracking list? Yeah, we, you know, it's interesting that that's a great question. And it's interesting because we did actually look at what Apple just came out with. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, it's more of a consumer offering yeah. than it is a commercial. We, Eric, you used to have a consumer offering and a, and a commercial offering. And, and I made the decision early on that, you know, you can't be all things to all people. And uh, it was much more a creative and value creating, uh, focusing on the commercial enterprise business uh, segment. So that's what we've done. So Apple's got a great product as, as usual, uh, but it's really targeted at consumer market that we, we're not in. 
Yeah, no, I completely agree. <laughs> so, so as investors, um, what what metrics to, to really understand how well AIQ is is ex executing? What metrics do you think us investors should be watching closely to, to see how you guys are doing? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, one of the things that, that we watch um, that you know, we, we encourage the, uh, the uh, investors to look at is our recurring revenue streams. You know, there, there are uh, ebbs and flows in those recurring revenue streams. It's not always linear and going up and to the right. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of ebbs and flows in those types of revenue streams for every company in our industry. And so you know, it's not always going to be linear, but if you see it steadily increasing over time, that's what we're focused on. And we believe that that is what's going to drive value uh, mm -hmm. for our shareholders and, and stakeholders alike. Um, so that's that's the one metric we look at. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, okay, so we have a follow-up question. I'll, I'll use this as the last question before we, uh, we let you wrap up. But um, um, just to confirm for investors, hardware revenue is not recorded when sold, but over term of the contract, correct? Um, yes, and no. it, it depends on the contract type again. The accounting rules are, are ridiculous these days, and, yeah. and I'm an accountant by training. I'm a, a CMA CPA by training. It's hard for me to say that, but as sitting in the CEO chair, now we're a public company, it's, it, it, uh, you know, we do recognize revenue from hardware at time of sale. In yeah. some cases, but not all cases. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's clear now. Um, oh, yeah. So we're sort of at the end of the presentation. What we always like to do is just give you a, a, you know, a couple minutes to, to leave everyone with a parting message or a key takeaway. Uh, so, Michael, um, what, what should investors leave uh, today's presentation knowing? Yeah, no, listen, Paul, I'm, I've am i never been more excited about AirIQ and the future of AirIQ than I am today. I believe that we have a lot more potential now than ever before to expand our recurring revenue streams uh, with our new product offerings, our, uh, you know, our, our uh, third party um, lead generation activities and our sales activities. I'm very, very proud and excited to be part of the team and where we can take the company uh, in the future. And so we believe that we will continue to do that and drive uh, increased shareholder value uh, as a result. So I'm very, very excited and I'm very uh, thankful for the opportunity to share your IQ story with you today and appreciate uh, as always your support and uh, continued interest in our IQ. Fantastic. Well, listen, we're fans. Um, we're certainly uh, cheerleading from the sidelines and I uh, hope you continue to do well. Um, if somebody wants more information, how do they get it? Maybe what's your website address? Yeah, so it's www.airiq.com. Simple as that, airiq.com. Perfect, perfect. Um, this has been great. Michael, thanks uh, for finally joining us. Uh, it's, it's been <laughs> Thank fun. Thank you for your and, patience, Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good to finally see your faces. We've had a lot of calls. Um, we've been speaking to Michael Robb, uh, CEO of AirIQ, uh, symbols IQ on the Venture Exchange. Uh, if anyone wants more information, please um, please view their website. Otherwise, Michael, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take care.